This week, what lies ahead for changemakers in 2018, the right and the rest. We'll talk politics, culture, and economics with Tasso Ramos and Sarah Ludwig, and I'll share a few cheers for the cities who divest. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. In his first State of the Union speech, for once, Donald Trump did the predictable. He cheered for his administration's triumphs and declared the country much improved. Growth is up, unemployment is down, Trump claims credit for the stock market's peaks. But that may not last as the effects of GOP spending cuts and tax breaks kick in. And beneath the snapshot headlines, what is actually going on? What's changed economically, politically? culturally? And what have we learned, not just about the Donald, but about the forces and dynamics that won him the White House? What is real, in other words, and what's rhetoric? And for those who worry about violence and division and panic, where are we seeing interesting or noteworthy alliances shaping up? To help me take stock of all of those questions and more, I bet, I welcome now Tasso Luis Ramos, Executive Director of Political Research Associates, a progressive research group with expertise in the right and the so-called alt-right, and Sarah Ludwig, who is founder and co-director of the New Economy Project, a longtime grassroots organizer for neighborhood equity and financial justice. Both are former guests on the show, but never together, and I'm thrilled to bring you back around the same table. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having us. Thanks. So let's start with the big question. What's changed? What hasn't? Politically, economically, culturally. Who wants to go first? Go ahead. Tarso. A lot has changed in a year, and quite a bit hasn't. One of the things that's changed is that some of Donald Trump's strongest detractors on the right, networks like the Kochs and the Mercers, have come to rally to his defense, including with promises of upwards of $400 million yeah. to spend the midterm elections. It's a kind of reward for the tax heist bill. Um, so the same folks who scuttled much of Trump's legislative agenda, because until the tax bill, really there was nothing that he could tur turn to as an accomplishment, are now rallying to his defense and trying to hold the line against the possibility of some blowback in the midterm elections. So that's a significant change. Uh, we've also seen the fall from grace and from Trump's inner circle of some um, uh, liaisons between the administration and the alt-right, the alt-light, folks like Steve Bannon and Sebastian Gorka. Um, but we still have unprecedented access to the White House from white nationalists, particularly around um, immigration reform uh, uh, by way of Stephen Miller and Jeff Sessions. Yeah. And so there's been quite a bit of change and some real continuity. All right. So sort of the political background, what about on the ground in real terms? What's happening with the people you work with, Sarah? Well, I mean, what's happening with the people we work with in New York, which is mainly people who are part of base building, organizing community-based organizations that are fighting for racial and economic justice, the, there's sort of an interesting duet, sort of dichotomy in the work. On one hand, I don't think that the analysis has changed for a lot of groups. A lot of the inequities that people have been working very hard to address haven't changed, meant they're systemic. Mm -hmm. So the analysis and the critique haven't changed. But the realities for so many people have really dramatically changed. How I think so? particularly about immigrant New Yorkers um, who are, you know, fighting for their lives ultimately. Um, and also just this sort of government for and by the 1%, which is so hideously transparent. You know, we've had other pendulum swings in the past politically when groups like ours stop fighting at the sort of for gains at the federal level, that's all been clearly abandoned. We've refocused our work very much on state and local and community organizing, which were always core parts, mm -hmm. but now it's all that we do. Um, so on one hand, you've got groups that are fighting to hold on to even meager gains um, from the previous administration. I think of certainly the, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, right. which is under front, full frontal assault. So we're fighting to hold on to that. A lot of resources are going into fighting for these 
crumbs, if you will, um, that you know we had a gi most gigantic meltdown, financial economic meltdown in 2008, and out came this you know, financial reform, which barely put reins on, on the Wall Street. And, you know, that's under assault. It's, there's a whole plan right now that Trump has put out to deregulate left and right. So one's fighting on that, but then there's tremendous sort of radicalization that's going yeah. on, which is very exciting to see, where groups realize that this kind of reformist approach to social justice and to these inequities has to take place in a more systemic way. So... All right, so let's get to the, ref the, the radical and systemic in just a second. But before trying to put these two pieces together, if what Sarah's saying is true, and it seems patently true when you look around, um, and the promises that Trump ran on in 2016, particularly to the so-called white working class, but to poor people, particularly white people, um, have proven this hollow, what happens to his political project? Well, I think what we've seen over the last year is that Trump has offered nothing of particular economic benefit to everyday people in this country. And so instead, what he's offered are non-material benefits to what he thinks of as his voting base, separate from his donor base right. and the constituency of the 1%, the Mercers and the Kochs and, and folks like that. And so we haven't seen, for instance, student loan relief, but we've seen a repeal of guidelines around sexual assault on campuses. We haven't seen uh, a manufacturing come back to the United States the way Trump promised in these hollow terms throughout the election campaign, but we have seen the Muslim ban, the ban on transgender service in the military. We have seen uh, him go after black identity extremists as though that was a thing. Um, in the United States in ways to signify support for um, his base defined in very exclusionary racial and ethnic terms. Because we have to remember the people who actually voted for him were not the poorest of the poor. That's they right. voted overwhelmingly Democratic. It was the people just above that, right? And That's, then further up. Which has been the traditional s base of support for reactionary authoritarian style politics. And many of those people really are going to be hurt, actually, by the tax reform that Trump managed to get through. And the folks who most benefit from that are exactly the donor class who are now pumping hundreds of millions of dollars to try to shore up um, their majority in Congress at this point. So I am hearing from both of you, and I appreciate you being together in this conversation, because I feel like these two conversations don't happen at the same table very often. Um, where do you see the connection between the work that Tasso's laying out, which is fairly scary stuff having to do with the fringes of democracy, what happens when people lose confidence um, and are turned against each other and are sold this bill of antagonism one from the other? How does your work relate to that? Because you must come across it in your new economy work. And new economy work isn't necessarily about racial justice or new politics. No, I think that's true. I mean, for us at our organization, New Economy Work is very explicitly about racial justice. Mm -hmm. It's rooted in creating a just economy that works for everybody, but it's fundamentally about racial and economic justice. It's about sustainability. It's about cooperation and so forth. So, I mean, what we're seeing groups do, which is very exciting, is not pursuing models that are new necessarily, but pursuing them much more enthusiastically and mm -hmm. rigorously. So whether it's creating community land trusts to take land out of the speculative market and put it within community control. I mean, you've got so many people who risk losing their homes and have lost their homes, all the pressures of displacement. Um, it's a way for people to stay in communities and, and have self-determination over land, over their housing and so forth. And linking that to other efforts like the formation of worker cooperatives and financial cooperatives where people actually have control over their money. And for these different models, and the list goes on, I mean, we're also working to create a public bank for New York um, to really sort of take Wall Street and all these destructive forces out of people's lives so that they can come together and really forge strong neighborhood hmm. economies that bring together these different sort of visions of cooperation that are such a different approach and really sort of a, people are looking for lasting solutions to withstand right. what's going on in the nightmare that we're living in right now. So it doesn't really get to your question of kind of tying these together, except that it's planting sort of a, a, a long-term vision in actually very practical models that people 
are showing by doing. It's sort of proof of concept by actually doing this right. work, but then bringing them together into a sphere so that people who are doing community-based financial organizing see the people doing mutual housing and community land trust, and that's what hasn't really mm. happened before in, in our work. And you, Tasa, you've been all over the country talking, as you said. Um, what have you seen, and what's inspired you in, in terms of the type of work that's happening? I think that one thing that connects the kinds of examples Sarah's giving to some other things I've seen is this tremendous challenge in this moment to, on the one hand, defend against the further erosion of kind of formal democratic infrastructure, much of it quite inadequate to the, to the task of democracy. So whether that's the Consumer Protection Bureau, whether that's the judiciary in this moment where Trump, one of his lasting impacts may be stacking the federal judiciary. Um, with people who've come out of the federal society and other kinds of things. So on the one hand, we have this task of shoring up totally inadequate institutions of democracy right. and simultaneously mobilizing tremendous energy yep. and support for more transformative changes down the road. That's an incredibly difficult set of challenges you know, to, to hold simultaneously. You see some of those dilemmas reflected in strategy around the elections. What sort of candidates are progressives going to back and what kind of electoral strategies? Is it going to be about deep investment in community capacity and mobilization and in the South and with black women leading the way, for instance? Or is it going to be the typical set of swing state, late uh, pilot drop in, uh, air war uh, uh, advertising kind of campaigns that we've come to expect? Uh, in this country, and there are f real fights over uh, over how that's going to play out. So this question of whether this is a moment um, that galvanizes um, enough people around transformation, or whether the bar becomes the very low bar of anything but Trumpism, is I think one of the one of the essential um, tensions and debates that's happening across many different kinds of campaigns, communities, sectors of the social justice. Yeah, movement. I call it the danger of Don of not Donaldism. Anybody but him. Anybody Did you want to come him. in on this? Well, yeah, I mean, it just picking up on what Tarso is saying, there's in the organizing world, there's sort of these new alliances that are being forged based on this dichotomy that we're talking about, which is do we defend and hold on to things that are being attacked and, and aggressively dismantled, whether it's public education? I mean, obviously, there's as a threshold all things environmental and climate related. Um, and, you know, are we working towards imagining and implementing a different vision and different approaches. And some groups are straddling that effectively and doing both, but there's also this sort of cleaving taking place where some groups, maybe they're holding on to the institutions and trying to ward off you know, real dismantling, but then some are still stuck in this notion that this is just a short-term thing, everything's gonna be okay. Obviously, we see a lot of the Democratic Party kind of on this mindset that, you know, we just have to kind of weather this and then you know, we'll be back to some status quo. Yeah. And that, I think, is quite dangerous, actually. Can we talk about the alt-right and, and misogyny for a minute? Because it may feel like a leap, but I'm thinking about so many of the people that I know involved in new economy work are women and women of color and immigrant women, people doing so much of the work about remaking society bottom up mm -hmm. are of the female variety. <laughs> um, and at the same time, we've had this Assault on women, rhetorical, actual, met by beautiful displays of courage and, and solidarity and intergenerational um, support. I think of that extraordinary um, uh, uh, Nasser hearing where Larry Nassar, the gymnast doctor, abuser, sex creep, um, was just called out by 150 women in the courtroom of that extraordinary judge. And um, I'm waiting for the backlash. I'm waiting for the backlash that you said was very much part of what brought Trump into power. Yeah. Where is it? Is it happening? Can I relax? Is it, <laughs> can I exhale yet? You cannot relax. I think that's clear. <laughs> no, there's, um, there's no, no relaxing allowed. Um, certainly part of the energy that delivered the boost for Trump, for, say from the alt-right, was as much about misogyny as it was about um, white nationalism and kind of ethnocentrism. And I think that persists to this day. I think there's a reason why DeVos at Education came in and immediately went after uh, standards around sexual assault on campus. I mean, that Proved was, just how anti-feminist she was. That was, just a, that was a reward to the base, um, as well as advancing a broader strategy around redirecting the priorities of the Department of Education in very scary ways. Um, 
and so the misogyny hasn't gone away by a long shot. And I think one of the big challenges for us in this moment is translating some of the righteous anger that we see represented in the Me Too phenomenon and the Nasser hearings and so forth into fo uh, focus on structural inequality. Yeah. So um, just as in the, in the uh, presidential election of 2016, there was one kind of progressive conversation around the economy and a separate one around race, in fact, the economy is structured in deeply racialized yeah. ways, yeah. just as it's, as it's structured in deeply yeah. gendered ways. Well, there was a third conversation about Hillary Clinton. Indeed, there was. And so, and yet, most of the national discourse around sexualism and sexual assault is happening on the level of interpersonal dynamics right. or contained within specific industries, as opposed to broadening that to a question of fundamental economic inequality that's baked into the U.S. system. Yeah. And so, after the election, there was a lot of sort of liberal hand wringing that, well, the problem somehow was that there was too much talk about racism and too much talk about sexism and gender right. and not enough talk about the economy in a way that would appeal to a white working class. And I think the lessons of this moment are not that um, the left progressives should shut up about race, uh, sexuality or gender, but that we have to talk about those things in ways that are actually related to economic inequality and related to the core issues that everybody's experiencing in this country. I, maybe just thinking out loud again, but it does seem to me that we can see what's happened around Me Too as about women's empowerment and gender violence. It is. Patriarchy, misogyny, all of that. But it's also people telling their truth yeah. and breaking some kind of an illusion of everything okay. And I wonder if in a way the new economy movement isn't a little bit of that too, of people saying, you know what? Actually, this economy that we've been told is okay, with ups and downs, but generally okay, capitalism, America, the American dream, it's really not okay, and let me tell you about my life. I think there's an element of that in people seeing the sort of sham that is Trump's spoken agenda and the sort of false populism of it all, and that as people see just this hideously transparent lie about what he's about and sort of the the talk versus the tax cut and all of that stuff that that's actually you know explicitly exacerbating inequality right you know that um, yeah the people as they see that sham they realize this is it where we have to really change the way that we approach everything that we work on and I think your point about understanding sort of the racial justice work and other and the gender justice work in an economic context is where we have to go next. I mean, the, every, you know, lots of people are saying this, but I'm just gonna say it again. I mean, Trump knows very well that people's fixation on his craziness, his family, Russia, you name it, is a very, actually serves him very well as a right. distraction. And it's a distraction from all the things that we're talking about. And there are people who see that distraction and they just wanna roll up their sleeves and change their communities and change their lives. And that's what we're seeing that's very exciting at the neighborhood level is it's mostly women, but not exclusively. It's mostly women of color that we're working with, a lot of immigrant women here in New York. Um, and you know, what choice do they have? I mean, it's a question also of survival to some extent, but the idea of sort of building community and going for broke in these times I think is partly about truth, mm -hmm. how you put it. And what happens to our structural analysis? I mean, to go back to the very important point you made earlier, how do we get to the structural pieces while we're really scared in lots of this country about an awful lot of people with an awful lot of guns? Mm -hmm. And a lot of license after this administration has been in power for so long. Well, look, it, it, this year, this past year was um, a high watermark for you know, white nationalist, fascist, openly fascist movements in the United States, at least for several decades, back to the 80s or early 90s. If we look at the level of mobilization, if we look at the level of political support and space, including um, defenses that came from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, even after the, the murderous rally in Charlottesville, um, it's just been an, a tremendous year for the white nationalist movement, notwithstanding the fall from grace of Bannon and other people who were kind of translators for that movement into the into the White House. So it is these are very scary times and at the same time we have a series of 
seemingly transparent economic betrayals, and they're yeah. certainly clear for the, to the kind of people that you organize. And a big question is, given the level of unpopularity, for instance, of, about the tax reform, the tax hike, which is just a giveaway, right, to the 1%, is at what point was, is that betrayal felt even by some of Trump's own voting base, and what do they do with that sense of betrayal? Right. Who interprets that betrayal for them? Who appeals and organizes them into some kind of an alternative to just rage and anger? Because it's not automatic that that sense of betrayal will result in a rejection of Trumpism. It could result in a further embrace of the xenophobia right. and the misogyny and the other elements that, um, that are part of his package. And couldn't there be a temptation in your part of this conversation, Sarah, for people to say, let's just create this co-op and not deal with our racial and other tensions because we'll never get the co-op part done. Let's not talk politics. Let's just try to create a credit union. I think that exists in some spheres. It's certainly not the work that we're doing because it. it's all very much deeply rooted in that. And, you know, we're... Yes, you can sort of have a co-op and have it not have anything to do with racial justice and it's just kind of a, an opting out that we're going to reject the sort of mainstream economic arrangements and over here do this side thing, kind of have a shadow economy. We're working to really change things in a much broader transformational way that um, isn't, that, that is about, um, yeah, what we're talking about. So, I mean, I think that, you know, here in New York, one of the things that's come out of this moment is that groups, labor groups, community groups, civil rights organizations have come together to create an affirmative agenda for the whole state of New York around economic justice. And so that's about to be unveiled. It's got these very clean, clear planks. It's about resistance. It's about neighborhood and, and personal self-determination for people in New York communities. And um, it ties together work that's already was going on, but pulled, it, we couldn't have pulled it together if mm. we were in a different moment, um, for sure. And it's also a rejection of attempts to deregulate the Wall Street, to um, sort of uh, introduce predatory lending in places where it's been banned. Um, that's been a big, big fight here in New York. Well, we're going to cover every step of your way. It sounds very exciting. Do you want to end on an up note of some kind, Tarso? Look, I think that um, these are very scary times. And um, is partly as a result of that, there are thousands, maybe tens of thousands more people who understand themselves as historical actors mm -hmm. in this moment yep. and are forming their sense of, or reforming their sense of self in their political identities. And so there is tremendous opportunity for organizers and educators like yourself to really inform the direction of that mobilization and make sure that it's not just a blip in short-term resistance work, but really about doing a combination of that resistance and building long-term alternatives. And so there's a lot to work with. All right. Well, we will be here every week doing that work. Thank you so much for being part of it. Appreciate both of you so much for coming in. The lines are drawn in oil, as it happens. On the one hand, a growing number of cities, states, and colleges. On the other, our very fossil-fueled administration and its president. New York City announced January 12th a multi-billion dollar lawsuit against five top oil companies, citing their contributions to global warming, damage to the city, and lies to the public. New York's also divesting its pension funds from investments in fossil fuel companies, amounting to some $189 billion being removed from 190 companies over the next five years. It's the biggest city and the biggest hunk of money to move yet. While Mayor Bill de Blasio and his team were busy divesting, President Donald Trump and his were preparing his first State of the Union speech. Trump's cabinet, lest we forget, is stacked with former fossil fuel executives. Rex Tillerson, former ExxonMobil CEO at State, Scott Pruitt, champion at EPA, and that's nowhere near a full list. Just hours before the big event, ExxonMobil was good enough to announce that it will be investing $50 billion in so-called American jobs thanks to the GOP's tax cut. And so the president was able to claim credit for Exxon's job promise in his big speech. This is our new American moment, said Trump. On that one point, we may agree. This story isn't really about progressive, a progressive mayor versus a fossil president. It's about a shift in consciousness 
The last few years have seen smart, persistent organizing on college campuses and shareholder meetings at law firms and bankers' offices and city hall conference rooms. All that work by people flipped what looked like responsible risk management from investing in familiar old firms to getting out of them, and better still, making them pay up. New York City's case isn't de Blasio's case, it's the people's. It says so clearly in the complaint. New York City versus BP, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, ExxonMobil, and Royal Dutch Shell. Read the case and decide for yourself. Where do you stand? As the president said, this is our new American moment. Thanks.